Um, our next speaker is Mary Devereaux. She is a philosopher and bioethicist at the University of California, San Diego. Her recent publications include work on ethical issues like cosmetic surgery and other medical enhancements, stem cell research, medical tourism, and reproductive medicine. In addition to her work in bioethics, Dr. Devereaux has also published widely in aesthetics and feminist theory, including essays on ethics and the arts, beauty and evil, artistic autonomy and freedom of expression, and the moral evaluation of narrative art. She currently teaches in the research ethics program in the School of Medicine, providing ethics training to medical and graduate students in the biological sciences. She serves on the Hospital Ethics Committee at the UCSD Medical Center, as well as on several institutional review boards for human research subject protection. Dr. Devereaux also holds an adjunct appointment at California Western School of Law, where she teaches in the Health Law Program. She speaks widely on ethical issues to academic and lay audiences. The title of her presentation is Engineering the Body, Engineering the Self. Please join me in welcoming Mary Devereaux. Thank you very much. I'm very pleased to be here. and I'd like to thank um, <clears throat> Darlene Weaver for inviting me. Um, I would like to start by acknowledging that I have a um, <clears throat> bug in my voice, so I hope it's going to uh, survive the afternoon. I don't usually sound like this, but I'm going to do the best that I can. OK. <clears throat> the title of this conference, Children of a Better God, Technology and the Next Humanity, um, is my starting place. I want to talk about technological advances in medicine and bioengineering. In particular, <clears throat> advances in body part replacement. I'm going to start by talking about some general things that we are doing in this area now, <clears throat> and that we're um, going to become uh, even more skilled at doing in the, in the future. Um, these are good technology, these technologies, they're saving the lives of many people. Uh, but I want to raise some questions about them. So I want to focus on a given area of medical advancement, familiar to most of us, and that is organ transplant. I'm going to use this as a kind of case study for my more theoretical remarks. I want to explore how our experience with organ donation over recent decades both reflects and contributes to changes in how we think about the human body and the self and the relationship between the two of them. It's my presumption that if we want, as our conference title suggests, to understand technology's impact on the next humanity, then we'd best start by examining some of the effects of what we're doing on this humanity. My goal here consists not in delivering a set of warnings or predictions, look out, this is what's happening, uh, but rather in leading us in the direction of framing the right questions. Uh, my assumption as a bioethicist and as somebody who works with uh, scientists rather directly is that it's much better to look ahead to what it is we're doing and reflect first rather than, as so often is the case, uh, sort of mopping up after something has gone terribly wrong. So let, let me start then by um, looking at what some medical, uh, what we're doing in medicine and bioengineering. Uh, my prelude is basically three examples from recent headlines. These are all from the last month, and then a general uh, uh, or sort of Greek myth. So this is the prelude. Uh, the first is an announcement recently that scientists have grown the world's first uh, urethra engineered. Uh, there are children who are born with um, the without the capacity to urinate properly. So. Uh, this obviously inhibits their life a great deal. And what was done was a bio bioengineering process by which some of the cells from these boys were harvested and grown around a tube like a straw until they seeded. And then basically this um, organic tube was implanted in their body, sewn in, and they were then able to urinate uh, naturally. And this study has followed these boys for about six years now, and so far this has worked quite successfully because the, uh, the grown biological matter has actually integrated into their bodies. The second example is the hand transplant, 
which has been done elsewhere in the world and is now beginning to be done in the United States. Uh, just a few weeks ago, the first hand transplant at the new UCLA Hand Transplant Center was completed. Um, and actually, the recipient um, was uh, a young woman who was the mother of three children. She had had an accident and lost her hand. The donor in this particular case came from my institution, from UCSD. Somebody died, and it was thought that um, this would be a good, uh, good match, and so, in fact, uh, this hand transplant was carried out just up the road from where we are. Um, and when the woman came out of surgery, it's reported in the media that she immediately lifted her new hand and went like this. Um, so although she's going to have a lot of need for physical therapy, it's really sort of remarkable what we're doing. Then the third of my three examples is face transplants. Uh, this one was from a Texas man who received a full face transplant. Um, and this one was done in Boston. There have been some others. Uh, generally speaking, the, the patients here have had either very severe electrical burns, as I think was the case with this man. His features were really almost eradicated. Uh, there was another case that you may have heard of, which was the woman who was attacked by several dogs and they chewed her, chewed her face very badly. Um, so these are really remarkable things that we're able um, to do from a urethra, which is something deep in the body that we would never see uh, or probably think of as long as it's functioning, to a hand, which is something we look at all the time, to something like the face, which we clearly identify with our sense of self-identity. So I promised you a Greek myth. Uh, my question, and I'm going to begin with this so we can think about it as I go forward, is are we becoming like Theseus's ship? Uh, the story here is that um, after a great battle, the ship was brought back and put on display because of the heroism of the, of the uh, men in their uh, sort of victory. And after a while, the ship, which was there sort of as in a museum to be looked at, uh, was noticed to have boards that were rotting and so on. And so as the story goes, and as you can read for yourselves, as time went by, the original planks were uh, eroded and they were replaced one by one as the sort of numbers indicate. And eventually the whole ship was replaced. All of the parts were new. None of the original parts were remaining. And this is a sort of logical puzzle that's been used for probably for centuries to talk about notions of personal identity. And the question is whether what we have is the original ship, call it ship one, or whether we have a completely different ship, ship two. Um, and my reason for introducing this myth following the three examples is just that increasingly with bioengineering, we're able to replace some of the parts uh, that Bill and Brent were both talking about in terms of things that um, are no longer functional in the human body. So if we're going to talk about transhumanism or posthumanism, we're going to need to be able to fix this body that sort of falls apart. So the question is, what happens after we've done that? Now, in one sense, organ transplants are nothing new. Uh, prostheses are nothing new. Replacement medicine goes back to um, at least to descriptions by Herodotus, who talks about people having uh, a Persian soldier who had a leg uh, replacement, sorry. Um, and uh, we've used uh, wooden feet or wooden pegs for uh, lost legs, hooks for hands and so on practically um, for many, many centuries. In fact, plastic surgery or cosmetic surgery goes back as far as uh, the early Egyptians. So this is really uh, the idea of fixing something on the body by adding a new part is really something that has a very long tradition. It's not something all that new. What is new is how sophisticated we've gotten. Um, this is a robotic arm, and as you can see, it is clearly uh, extremely functional. So what I want to do now is to look in more detail at what it is we're doing and where it is we might be going in the near future. So I'm going to look at some biomedical advances. I'm going to talk about what we often call uh, regenerative medicine uh, or replacement medicine. And I have various stages of this. So this is replacement medicine one. Um, 
And as you can see on the slide, uh, there are various body parts that we can now replace. Uh, we uh, can do things with limbs. We were just looking at that. Solid organs, defibrillators, dialysis, uh, sensory organs, hearing aids, <laughs> glasses. Um, we can even do things with um, things like the teeth. Uh, we can now do all kinds of fancy implants, which is good news for the dentist because since we've started putting um, things in the water, they don't get much money making uh, filling cavities anymore. So a lot of these things can now be fixed. Uh, medicine has gotten very sophisticated. Um, and uh, basically, the model that we often use is as a, of the human body as a kind of car or as a machine. Um, things can break down, like uh, the heart, have heart attacks and the heart no longer functions very well. Things slow down the capacity to run, or as we heard this morning, the capacity to play soccer, to reproduce, um, even to remember, where did I put my keys? Right? Uh, what time am I supposed to be there for my morning class? Things also fall out, hair, teeth, uh, and things change appearance. We start sagging, getting wrinkles, uh, looking older. Um, so basically, a lot of this discussion about um, bioengineering and advances is about thinking about the body as a sort of car or as a machine. And personally, I, um, I've only had two cars in my life. I like to keep them running about 20 years. Um, so I'm very familiar with this. Things fall off, things you know, sort of start looking funny, and you just keep repairing one thing after another. And this is kind of the model of the human body that we're working with now. So basically, we have this growing list of mechanical additions to the body, and we're no longer just flesh and blood. Uh, so what I want to look at now is a second stage in replacement medicine, and that is uh, looking some at the technological advance of using organs themselves rather than mechanical bits or parts to fix the things that have gone wrong. So this is what I call replacement medicine two. Um, the, uh, the implants are no longer mechanical, but human. They're often cadaveric. That is, they come from a dead body, from one human person to another. Uh, we now share blood. It's very common, uh, blood uh, transfer, organs, tissues, cells. And it's now common to find um, that a large percentage of these things can be substituted. So again, looking at our list, we now don't need to use some kind of mechanical device for organs. We can use the actual organs themselves. Limbs, we just looked at an example of a hand transplant, again, from a cadaver. Face transplants uh, with eyes instead of glasses. A lot of people are getting corneal implants, um, and of course, uh, one thing that's even um, more interesting, and I think has been a discussion even in this forum in previous years, is reproductive medicine. Uh, if you want to have a child um, and you are somehow uh, impaired in terms of your fertility, we now have mechanisms where you can use a sperm donor or an egg donor or even both in order to have, um, to have a child. So we're replacing all kinds of things. Um, so the idea here is it's not just that we're not flesh and blood anymore, it's that we're not just our flesh and blood. Uh, a lot of times in science fiction, you have all of these films about chimeric things, people with implants in their brains or pig hearts and so on. If you go on the internet, you can find all kinds of very creepy, very strange pictures um, of pig men and so on. Uh, I think they're mostly figments of um, graphic design done on the internet. Uh, but nonetheless, the idea is that we are able to merge bodies from one person to, uh, to, an, to the next. And this has been widely successful. It's taken a while, but over the last decades, we have increased the number of organ donations. We've increased the survivability of patients who get organ donations. Um, and we've, uh, we've also increased the length of time that somebody can go with an organ transplant. In fact, we have some patients now who say got a kidney 20 years ago or 10 years ago, 
and then they need a new kidney and they have a second transplant. So uh, one of the results of this, of course, is a growing demand for organ donors. Um, and what, we're what we see often is that the demand for organ donors comes from families and from patients who are on these very long lists. And there's a lot of talk about how it is that there's a kind of resurrection of the body, to use the sort of Christian imagery here. Uh, this is a case of a family um, with one son who has been the recipient and another son who was the donor. And the quotation uh, is, an organ transplant is a resurrection of sorts for both donor and recipient. It is sobering, to say the least, to think of one's transplant as a gift of life, but not just any life, a gift of life from the dead. Um, the good news is that we're doing this quite successfully. The bad news is that there's this huge disjunct uh, between what we need and what we um, have. The waiting list, uh, as of a few days ago when I last <clears throat> went on the internet to look, in the United States was over 72,000 patients. March 29th, 249. If you go to these sites, you can literally see the numbers changing. Uh, the donors in 2010 were 14,506. So you do the math. It's a great um, gap. The other thing to mention here from an ethics perspective is that for most of these patients who are on the donor list waiting for an organ, this is their only chance of, of life. Basically, they're going to die and often die within a pretty short uh, period of time. The other ethically relevant factor is that this is a pretty successful, as I said, successful surgery, successful technology. So one question I wanted to raise is about how we're thinking about organ transplant from body to body, what it does to our sense of sort of reciprocal responsibility one to another, how it ties us together, does it increase empathy um, when in fact we're bound in these kind of artificial families from uh, organ donor to organ recipient? Um, or is it in fact, as some evidence is suggesting, that perhaps in this society because of our success and because of the growing gap between what we need and what we have available, that what was initially understood both rhetorically, symbolically, ethically as a gift of life is increasingly being seen more as an entitlement. Uh, one of the people that works at our organ donation procurement organization, which is a nonprofit attached to the university medical school, tells a story about going to, they have support groups for people who are donor, or, sorry, for people who are waiting for organs. And uh, my colleague is a minister and works with heart patients who are waiting on that list. And he tells the story of walking into one of those meetings recently, and somebody came up to him really quite aggressively and said, Don, where is my heart? And that's the sort of shift I'm, I'm interested in exploring, from this is a gift to maybe this is um, something that's an entitlement. Um, the, picture on the right, the little girl uh, standing next to a trash can. One of these two will get your organs. You decide. Um, the idea is, uh, and there's actually been uh, a nice paper written by a man named Glannon recently called, uh, Do the Sick Have a Right to Cadaveric Organs? Exploring that, um, um, that demand. His answer is no. Uh, but my observation is that increasingly in patient communities, we're moving towards um, more of an entitlement set of assumptions. So do I have an obligation not to waste my organs? Um, do I have an obligation to myself, to my own body, uh, or ethically as a responsible sort of person? I own my body, therefore I decide. Um, but there is also this idea that once I die, even if I carry a donor card, uh, in most hospitals these days, if the family really resists organ donation, um, the life sharing and various other organizations will not go to surgery without the family's permission, 
even if it's very clear and clearly documented that that is what the, the dying patient wanted, which was to be a donor. So there are all these interesting questions, I think, that we're only really beginning to think about um, in terms of who the body belongs to. Does it belong to me? Where there's a long tradition. Uh, in fact, there's a contemporary tradition in Japan still, and I think even in our own country and in North America, that basically the body belongs to those who bury it, which is a story that, of course, goes back to Antigone and, and so on. Um, or is the body something that is owed to those who need it in order to live themselves? So in order to answer this question, I think we need to go a bit deeper. And so what I'd like to do in the second half of this talk, having looked at some of the things we're doing in organ donation, is to look at some of the ethical and philosophical questions by uh, sort of looking more carefully at some of the assumptions we make about the body and embodiment. <clears throat> and this actually follows up on some of the things we were talking about this morning. OK, so the body. Um, what is it? Um, I start with a couple of sort of classical passages, one from Alexander Pope, one from Shakespeare. Um, this idea that we are somehow fixed on this earth to sort of draw nutri nutrition, propagate, and then rot, or sort of, you know, we're these mortal beings, and that's the cycle of life. Um, or the sort of Shakespearean view, out, out, brief candle, life's but a wailing shadow, or walking shadow, poor player. Um, it seems to me that we have moved, and maybe we can come back to this in discussion, but my own sense is that we've moved fairly far away from these attitudes, and although we may not be yet in a post-human present, that these sort of post-human uh, or transhuman temptations, as Bill was putting it, um, have really got hold of our imagination. And this idea that somehow it is the, um, the life trajectory to be born and be a child and, and become an adult and have your own children and then, I don't know, what we do in retirement and then sort of daughter off the stage or find our ice, ice flow, that um, we're, we're really shifting away from those ideas. So I thought I'd spend a little bit of time talking about the Body and Medical Thought and Practice. There's a lovely book by a man named Drew Later by the same name, The Body and Medical Thought and Practice, which I highly recommend if you're interested in this. Um, and what he, sh he uh, argues is there's been a radical shift from the medieval view of the body to the, to the sort of modern one. Um, that the body now is something that uh, we really do think of as a car or as a functioning mechanism. Of course, this is not a 20th or 21st century view. It's a view that goes back to um, Descartes. Descartes was the first who really thought of the body as something extended as mere matter, um, as something that, in fact, worked like a machine. His idea was uh, that the body was like a clock or a watch. You could open it up, and you could see the gears and the parts. It was complicated, but basically, if something broke, you could replace a gear or a spring and you could get it to work. Um, you could get it to work again. And that basically the idea here is um, that death is not you know, the loss of some spirit uh, so much as it is a running down of these, um, these parts. And that what we can do to fix things is simply to put in new parts. Now, one of the things about what I call this model, the biomechanical model, is it doesn't tend to differentiate all that much between a dead body, um, which is still, of course, animated, um, and how we think about um, the, living, the living body. That is, that the difference between the corpse and the living body is that the living body is still functional. But basically, this idea of um, what, when we teach our medical students, we talk about you know, the sort of person in the patient uh, as opposed to, you know, just the, um, the heart patient in room two or the diabetic in room three. Uh, that tends to get lost on this model. Aristotle's view was uh, quite different, of course, uh, sort of view that was uh, um, predominant with the Greeks and then uh, dominated really the, the sort of medieval period. Aristotle says that a hand, going back to one of our early examples, removed from the body is no longer a hand. Why? Because for uh, Aristotle, a thing's nature 
was uh, situated in its function. So once you basically remove the hand so that it's no longer uh, close to the body, it couldn't function any longer as a hand, it couldn't grasp, it couldn't touch. Um, but of course, uh, the Greeks didn't envision hand transplants. Uh, in fact, I would say probably even 10 years ago, we weren't ever imagining that you could actually transplant something like a hand. Uh, of course, 30 years ago, we weren't imagining hearts, so it does show how we're um, advancing in this arena. Now, um, there's a lot of criticism of the biomechanical model that things get left out, that we don't uh, recognize uh, the complication or the organic whole or the patient and so on. But the power of the mechanical model, I think, is incontrovertible. Um, that it does offer a lot of control, that it allows scientists to look um, at finer and finer parts, the invention of the microscope and the electron microscope and cellular and molecular biology have really allowed us to understand more and more about not just the healthy body, but also about the diseased body from the sort of outside of the body in. So it's a very, very powerful, um, powerful model. It allows us when things break or fall off or don't look good anymore to basically open up the body with surgery and to be able to substitute parts like organs, corneas. Um, and it also allows us, of course, um, to alter things like hormonal inputs and outputs, sometimes with great success, sometimes less so. Uh, you may remember the uh, brouhaha over hormonal repla hormone replacement therapy. For a long time, everyone was told, every woman who me hit menopause was told that she needed to uh, increase her hormonal levels back to the level of a much younger woman. Now, of course, we know that many of the claims that were made for how it was going to strengthen the heart and so on turned out not to be the case. But the power of this is that in understanding not only the healthy but the diseased body, we can also address these things um, one part at a time. Now, one critique of this um, by basically a lot of ethicists and also more humanistic physicians or medical educators is that it reduces the body to a thing. Um, I'm not so worried about the body being reduced to a thing, but when the patient gets reduced to a thing, that does become a problem. So um, again, some of the uh, troubling dimensions of this are that uh, the psychological, social, and existential dimensions of, to go back to my uh, core example here, of transplantation get left out. Um, and there's a lot of empirical literature that I've only just recently begun to uh, survey, which is quite interesting, uh, that there are recipient feelings of, um, for example, there's some studies of heart transplants done in 2009 that showed that the recipients are often <clears throat> very disturbed surprisingly so, by the post-experience or the post-operative experience of having had a heart transplant. It's known, for example, in the literature that it's really common for people who have a heart transplant to get depressed. Um, but there's also these very interesting, complicated issues about identity and feeling somehow connected. There are a lot of films, we were talking about film this morning, popular media about you know the woman who loses her husband she gives his heart to somebody else. And then, of course, she just happens to meet the somebody else who also happens to be a young, available, interesting man who has the heart of her previous husband and how there's this you know, um, uh, inexplicable you know, immediate attraction between the two of them and so on. Now, that's the movies. But in fact, the literature shows that there are really strong feelings, at least among some families, that the donors want to know the recipients, and the recipients very much want to know the donors. Um, pretty much the practice until recently, the medical practice has been that people do not know anything except the most basic facts about their donor. Your donor was a man in his 40s. He was in a motorcycle accident. Um, that kind of thing, but not where they lived or who they were and whether they had families or any of those kinds of things. And now, in fact, we have networks, in part um, advanced by another technology, which of course is the internet, where people have 
made efforts, just like they have with adoption, to find who or to try and find who their donors were and to, re, uh, to reconnect. Okay. And of course, these feelings are hard to explain if what you have is a biomechanical model, because on the biomechanical model, your heart has failed. I have taken your heart out. I've put you on machines until I can get the new heart uh, put into your chest. We sew you up, and there you are. Uh, but there's this interesting connection where, in some sense, uh, some of us are carrying around that human tissues, human parts, human organs from each other. And my question is how do we think about that? So um, this takes us to this question of the relationship of the body to human identity and what actually we are, what it is to be uh, embodied. This is a term that Bill brought up over and over again in his talk, and I think it's uh, something that's worth exploring. There are two models, uh, or at least two models, and look at these two, of the relationship of the body to human identity. The first is the one we've been talking about, that is of replaceable parts. And typically on that model, the idea is I own my body. You don't have claim on it unless I give you claim. If I carry a donor card, you can harvest my organs, otherwise not. That I have, in fact, in legal terms, property rights over my body. And we have all these ideas about how it is that uh, self-determination allows us to make decisions, not only now, you offer me a surgery and I decline, but also after my death, that after my death, I have a right to disposition uh, over what becomes of my body. If I wanted to go to medical students, which having taught in a medical school now for some years, I do not, whether I wanted to go to other patients, uh, what organs I'm willing to give and what I am not, etc. And of course, this model of the body as a machine with replaceable parts is very well suited to the transplant situation. Um, the other body, the other model, is one that again is based on some of the empirical literature, and that's what some people call the integrated self, where you know my body is part of whom I really am. And the way I think to think about this is not how you might think about something being added to you but how you think when you lose some part of yourself. Um, we were talking about the, uh, um, the loss of the ability to play soccer as quickly as we used to. But think about how some men feel about the loss of their hair, right, baldness. Um, think about how people returning, say, soldiers from uh, Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, what, a, what an impact it has upon the self when somebody returns an amputee or a double or, or triple amputee. Um, or these people who have undergone face transplants because they have been um, disfigured in some sense. So when you think about loss or change in the bodies that we have and that we identify with, even if it's changed through age, um, I think you get a sense that uh, this idea that the body is very central to our sense of identity and self uh, is, is fairly um, convincing. And of course, that's a very um, central idea in the Judeo-Christian uh, tradition. Um, uh, as William May puts it, the person not only has a body, uh, she is her body. So those are two quite different models. Um, Margaret Sanner, whose work I've been reading, uh, she's a medical anthropologist, she's done a number of studies of public attitudes towards organ donation. And she asked this question, am I exchanging spare parts or am I becoming a new person? It's a really interesting question because in fact, a lot of the evidence shows that people have um, attitudes towards receiving organs from other people. And of course, some donors are alive. Most donors, of course, are dead. So this connection from one self to the next is not just from one live self to the next, but in many cases, in fact, in the majority of cases, it's from self to self, but also across the life-death barrier. I have somebody's heart, but I don't have a live donor for a heart. I might have a live donor for a kidney, um, but if I've got a heart donation, or a face transplant, or a hand transplant, or corneas, I am those are from somebody who has already died, and I think that's conceptually 
and uh, philosophically and ethically um, interesting. So this is the sort of thing that Sanner is um, looking at. <clears throat> and what she's found is um, varying attitudes. She's done this within um, North America, but she also did some cross-culturally. And um, what she found is that um, there are a number of attitudes on the part of both donors and um, recipients, and I've just marked a couple of them here that we'll go through. I'm sorry, my voice is really going. Can I still be heard? Yes. Yes? Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to think that I sound like Marlene Dietrich or something, but as my daughter said, I think I sound more like a sick frog. <laughs> okay. So some of the things she found about donors is um, just this um, idea that um, the parts of the body are not really regarded by most people as commodities, as something that they are willing to buy and sell. And this comes up because if you go back to the earlier discussion about the gap between um, the demand and the, and the availability of organs, um, basically there have been all kinds of proposals now made about um, opening up a market, a paid market, um, for organ donations. Some people will argue, and they argue not from a monetary or an economic uh, um, grounds only, but on ethical grounds, that if people are dying for lack of organs, then we need to do whatever is possible to up the rate of procurement and donation. And some people will say, if it takes paying people to do this, then we should do it. We could pay families for burial costs, we could pay live donors. As you probably know, there are places in the world <clears throat> where there are very active black markets in organs. Uh, medical tourism is something that a, a scientist colleague of mine and I have written a couple of papers about. People going abroad because they cannot get an organ here. Um, there is evidence that some of the organs in China and elsewhere are coming from executed prisoners. Um, there's clear evidence that kidney donors are coming from uh, poor people who are kidnapped in uh, countries and basically anesthetized and a kidney is taken. Uh, other places people are being paid for a kidney, but often they do not get the remuneration that they were promised, often uh, because of the poor medical care that they get. They're very... Um, they don't do well medically afterwards. So although the idea is if I can get $5,000, I can dig my family out of poverty, often, in fact, the literature shows that's not the case because people are often the breadwinners of the families. It's often the men, the young men who do this, and um, they do not, uh, they can't return necessarily to full-time full -time work. So um, there's a lot of demand for this, but the donors are... Um, somewhat reluctant to go in this direction, seeing organs as vitally important, um, and seeing this um, idea of giving rather than selling an organ as something that is essentially altruistic. Uh, it's part of a gift economy, and that for many donors and donor families, the argument is we do not want to change to a market economy from this kind of gift giving altruistic exchange, that something very important will be lost by doing that. And then, of course, what about the recipients? Um, well, some recipients, as I've said, really feel that this has affected their identity, that they feel somehow not only connected to their donor, but somehow that they are different. And I'm sure you've all heard these stories of, you know, I recovered from my kidney transplant or my heart transplant, and I went home, and I just was dying for peanut butter. I never ate peanut butter in my life, and now I can't get enough of it. And then they find out, yes, their donor was a great lover of peanut butter or pickles or, I don't know, peach ice cream or some such thing. Um, uh, Santa also found that um, there are different ways of thinking of what that relationship with the organ is. Um, she talks about this idea of contagion, that some people feel that they would not want, for example, an organ from certain kinds of people, um, 
often we've had donors ask, if I donate an organ, can I determine where it goes? And the answer is no, you can't generally. Um, but there are also recipients who will say, I do not want to take an organ from, say, a prisoner or somebody who has a criminal record or somebody me who meets some other profile of theirs. Um, you know, I'm, uh, I want somebody of the same religious persuasion or what have you. And what Sander has found is that people have this idea somehow that the, um, the integration of this organ or these tissues is going to somehow uh, carry some kind of contagion. And that if the person was, you know, had some attributes, medical, physical, psychological, religious, that they felt uncomfortable with, that this is something that um, would be disturbing to, um, to them. Another thing is that some people feel that it's like a form of cannibalism. They say, I could never take a transplant. I would feel like I was taking something from somebody else. Particularly, I think people think that about, you know, sort of um, uh, basic organs in the, in the visceral. Uh, another attitude she found is the threat to the reincarnated body. In fact, I was doing a, um, a workshop recently and this issue came up. Um, and one of my students asked me, she said, well, this sounds kind of funny, but if I'm an organ donor, and she said, I mean, I believe in the resurrection of the body. What if I donate my corneas and I sort of get there and now I can't see? And I thought that was her question. And I thought, well, I'm not sure that's all that different from, you know, um, you lose your eyesight some other way or your hair falls out or, you know, something else happens. I mean, that's, I'm not sure. Maybe the theologians can tell us whether if the body is resurrected, whether it is your old body that gets resurrected or some younger, better sense of the, the self that gets resurrected. But this is a serious thing that some people feel. And then the last attitude she found was that there was something very unnatural about doing this. This goes back to Frankenstein and even to the early history of uh, medicine when medicine first started doing anatomy. And first it was artists and then uh, medical people who uh, would go and dig up dead bodies um, in order to have uh, human cadavers in order to study either for life drawing or for uh, for medicine, but that somehow there was something very unseemly and uh, disturbing about this whole process. Uh, one of the things I think is really interesting about organ donation is how um, comfortable we have become with it and how much um, I think many of these attitudes now are minority attitudes. Uh, they're not things that most people um, think about. In other words, my conclusion here is um, I think this biomechanical model isn't really adequate to what's going on in organ transplant, that we're not just carburetors, um, and that this kind of set of assumptions, these metaphysical assumptions about the body, um, aren't really adequate to the range of um, public attitudes, and that that has an, uh, an impact medically, it has an impact socially in terms of what we're doing, and it certainly ought to have an impact on public policy in terms of thinking about payment. Uh, Iran, I believe, is the only country now that has an official policy of paying for organs, but of course it's a different kind of government, much more controlled and repressive, and so on. Um, and then the last point I want to talk about here is um, some of the work of Shepper Hughes. Uh, she's a really, um, she's probably done more than anybody else to look at the black market in organ donation. And one of the things she talks about, she's written a nice paper called The Tyranny of the Gift, and that is um, live donation <clears throat> is generally within families or within social sets. Sometimes it's a religious group, sometimes it's um, family or community. But they'll go and find a donor for someone. And what Shepard Hughes has found is that often there are family pressures uh, she looks at this more as a medical anthropologist or a sociologist. Um, typically in um, couples, uh, when um, one partner needs an organ, uh, if you actually look at the rates wives give to husbands far more frequently than husbands give to wives, and what that says. A um, couple of you are interested in feminist theology. We'll come back to that maybe. 
Um, the other thing she found is that in sort of traditional communities, um, or even in perhaps some less traditional communities as in North America, if you actually look at families where um, they need something where there's a match, generally speaking, the person who gifts the organ is female, and she's the lowest status female in the family, often unmarried, um, often working at lower paying, lower status kinds of jobs. So one of the things she's raising is the ethical question, and again, a sort of public policy question about um, the uh, troubling, uh, perhaps, power relations at work in what we uh, like to think of as a free gift economy. Uh, but again, if you have a sibling uh, or a family member who is going to die without a part, uh, without an organ transplant, and you're a match, it's very difficult to say no. In fact, this is one of the standard sort of ethical conflicts we often talk about when we teach medical ethics. And that is somebody comes in and their kid or their brother needs an organ and they do not want to donate. Do you tell the family that the father is a match but he doesn't want to donate to his daughter or to his brother? Or do you, I mean, honesty would suggest that you do or is that part of patient confidentiality? Difficult questions. Um, again, uh, talking about the heart um, this is a place where particularly recipients often feel that um, they're, they're tied to uh, that person who gave to them. Okay, so deeper issues or final issues, um, sort of where are we going? Um, some people will talk about, um, <clears throat> in fact there's a paper by this name, infinite replacement, finding what's broken and then simply fixing it one part at a time. Um, and I think of us as, are we really going to start thinking about ourselves, our mortality, our finitude, our health, as something that is infinitely fixable? I'm not sure we're, any of us here now have any reasonable chance of thinking about living forever. Um, on the other hand, we are living a good bit longer, and we are fixing more and more parts that fall apart. Um, is this a false promise? Um, this promise that basically medicine and technology and maybe the singularity or various other kinds of information technology are going to be able to thwart sort of suffering and death, eliminate them, or as Foucault says, exercise finitude. Uh, the promise is too that we can also look really young. Um, after all, when we... Um, talk about living longer, one of the things I like to ask my students is, how many of you would like to live another 20 years? Everybody raises their hands, right? Um, and then I say, and which 20 years do you want? Do you want 80 to 100? The hands all go down, right? Those of us who are getting older, you know, we want our 20s and our 30s back, or maybe, you know, 40s. But nobody wants their 80s over again or their 90s. Um, those are not the years we're, we're thinking about. So the idea is we're going to be able to fix it all and we're going to look good in the, in the process. Um, one of Drew, Later going, Drew, Drew Later's criticisms, again, going back to the book on medical thought and the biomedical model, is that death is really seen as a defeat in medicine now rather than a natural termination of life processes. Um, and we definitely see this with fights over uh, medical futility, families who want everything to be done despite the fact that the person they want everything to be done for is never going to leave the hospital, is never going to be able to leave an ICU unit. Um, this idea of um, death as, I mean, you know, in medicine people say there are worse things than death, but um, I think we have a culture that is more and more death a verse, and maybe that's something we can come back to and talk about. Um, the idea of um, dialysis, for example, in the literature, um, we're starting to see evidence of um, the use of dialysis. You know, dialysis is now covered by the federal government. Um, and that was because back when there were um, um, the early uh, possibilities of doing dialysis, people were dying, and there was, you know, the Seattle God Committee that was charged with figuring out who was going to get 
the technology and be able to live and who wasn't. And they were using social worth criteria. You know, somebody was uh, going to cure cancer or somebody already had cured cancer. Um, and the federal government stepped in and said, we'll just fund this for everybody. But the idea then was that we were going to get people back to a productive life. Now what's happened is we're seeing that dialysis is being used for later, uh, for older and older people and people who have many comorbidities. That is, it's not just that they have uh, kidney failure for which dialysis um, will be able to you know, maintain them until they can get an organ transplant. But we're now dialys dialysizing and even uh, transplanting people in their 80s and 90s. That's still unusual, but we're, we're definitely shifting in that direction. Um, so I'm going to end with a couple of last slides with uh, questions that I, um, in my own work, feel a need to uh, try to think about an answer. And that is really, what are the proper goals of medicine? And one of the things, as I was saying at lunch, that makes answering these questions or dealing with specific cases with families and hospitals and so on is that I don't think we have a really good answer to that question. We do not have an idea, um, a sort of um, agreed upon notion of what constitutes health because we don't have an agreed upon notion of what constitutes a good human life. Um, the idea is uh, what is acceptable to do ethically morally, in terms of public policy, is whatever meets self-determination. As long as the patient is fully informed and the patient is making a consented decision, that's the direction we should go in. And I think that model is clearly inadequate and is not able to answer even the questions about this humanity, let alone the, uh, the, next, the next humanity. Um, so that's it. Questions and answers. Thank you. Questions? <clears throat> no one wants to answer, ask a question because no one wants to hear this voice anymore. interesting question. <clears throat> uh, the question is how do shows like CSI and some of the other um, uh, basically sort of, you know, detective shows but also pathology, you know, medical pathology shows and house, those kinds of things, the way in which they depict the body, how that's perhaps helping to shape, both maybe reflect and shape our attitudes towards the body. I think it's a really interesting question. Um, and as I, before I did bioethics, I did aesthetics. And um, it's making me think that that's a really interesting thing to look at because a lot of what you see in those television shows are um, oh those kind of zoom images of you know going through the arteries and going down into the digestive system because I don't know the the person swallowed a baseball or something you know it's down there and you can see it um, uh, so it is really sh seeing the body as two things one is parts but the parts are made very intellectually engaging, um, very lively, lots of motion, lots of colors, um, because they're all digitalized. So aesthetically, it's very interesting. Intellectually, it's very interesting. Um, but it doesn't have any connection at all with the, the, the sort of life that was lost, this, this sort of person. Um, and the... Um, the other thing is 
that those shows often show the corpse. So they're, they're interesting things they're doing inside, but there are other interesting things they're doing outside. And you just see the body as object in morgue, not as something else. I mean, I contrasted a little bit with, um, what's the show? I always call it Missing, but that's not its actual title. About people who disappear and you have 24 hours or something to find them because after that, there's, do people know what I'm talking about? Without a trace. Without a trace, thank you. What I like about Without a Trace is that you start with this person who's disappeared. They're absent. But in fact, what the show does is to show you progressively more and more about the self, about the life that led to a place where somebody decided to disappear. Because the starting premise of that show is always, oh, somebody, at least apparently, had this wonderful life, you know, this really loving wife, and these adorable dogs, and these really respectful children. Um, and it's only later that you find out, you know, that the children are not respectful at all, um, that they're stealing from their parents, and the wife is trying to poison the husband, and, you know. So you can understand why he wants to disappear without a trace. But what's so interesting there is the narrative. Again, you know, you're getting immersed piece by piece in the life. And as the show goes forward and, you know, the clock is ticking and your chances of finding them alive are going down, your attachment to the person is going up. So I think that's a really interesting contrast to the shows you're talking about. Um, yeah. I, I guess the one thing I think about often is there's no reverence mm. for the body. In other words, in cultures where when someone dies, the family washes the body and <clears throat> clothes the body, and, and there's a sense of all of that communal yes. feeling there. This is just the detached corpse. Yes. And, Anyway, well, I think that's true. Um, one thing that would be interesting to look at, um, I like your suggestion, would be to actually look at whether there's any corresponding change in our attitudes towards funeral rites. Um, when I was a little girl and my relatives died, they were always laid out for several days, and you went to this funeral home and you basically had kind of social hour with the dead body. In my grandparents' generation, as my parents related, um, my family is Irish, um, people died at home and people were set up in the parlor um, and people came to visit and, you know, and there were all these terrible jokes and, you know, putting things on the body and stuff. But the point was that people were, um, there was this whole set of social customs. I don't know whether as reverent, perhaps, as what you're describing, but there was this whole thing about washing the body and burying the body. Even if you think about going back to Homer and the Antigone and so on, the idea of, of not being able to bury the body is really a very strong impulse. Now, one of the things, I don't know if my daughter knows this, but she's in the audience. Um, I actually sit on UCSD's um, anatomical disposition committee. That is for people who donate their bodies to the medical school for the um, anatomy labs. Um, there's a committee that works out policies and things. And one of the things we're very, very careful about is apparently every organ and piece of the body that's used for medical education is tracked um, so that um, that can be brought, uh, usually when people donate to medicine, they're not going to get the body back. But there's very great care, even in that setting, about sort of the body and a kind of reverence for it. And I agree, I do think we're losing more of, more of that. I don't think people are as, um, we don't see people die, we don't see dead bodies. Um, and I think there is also a way in which we've continually been shown these images of sort of false perfection. We were talking about perfectionism this morning um, with all the cosmetic surgery and all the photographs and so on. And I used to always remind my students when we talked about beauty, remember, you know, the models and the actresses, those people, they don't look like that either. Those photographs are constructed. So I think, I think this idea of trying to think of ways in which we can hold on to those traditions of reverence for the body is, is, is a good one. So.
So thank you. <coughs> yes, thank you very much for the lecture. Um, interested in the business of donation, recipient and um, donor. In terms of um, hand, heart, face, those are all elements of human existence that are deeply embedded in symbolic forms in our culture. Yes. So a face relates back to the Latin notion of a persona, the mask that one yes. wears. You think of the hand of God, the invisible hand even, mm -hmm. um, handshakes, uh, the heart at the core of one's being. Right. Do any of these you know or have you thought about or research on how the symbolic density of these different parts of the body affect the way a recipient deals with the transient? Because it's not just that we have bodies, that's kind of abstracted. Right. We have a whole bunch of symbolic forms that we've also <clears throat> inherited through our culture in terms of how we see parts of our body. Right, right. <clears throat> yes, no, it's a, it's a good point. That is that these three, hand, <clears throat> hand, face, and heart, are the most um, heavily significant um, and weighted, and that's why I think it's worth looking there. And yes, people have looked at that. There's a lot of work done, or some work done, anyway, on the heart. And you know, there are people who've traced the history of the symbolism of the heart, and even how even medical conceptions of the heart have shifted. So that, as one writer said, you know, by the time you get the heart in that container that I showed on one of the slides, you know, human organ, um, it's been stripped of all of those symbolic meanings. And it's been stripped of that personal identity of who it came from. Um, so yes, I think there's a lot of significance to those things. I mean, you could take certain other, um, my brother-in-law, for example, tore his knee in an athletic injury and he had it opened up. And at one point, I think he had some fascia or something put in. I don't know whether it's from a human donor or a pig. Um, I think it's human. Um, but I don't think there was any real great reflection or hair pulling or philosophical or existential angst over having this bit of fascia in the, in the knee, right? But I mean, the other place I think to look that would be kind of interesting is at corneas, because it's such a small thing, it's so external, and yet it has to do with the eyes and looking into the, you know, the self, soul, and all of those kinds of things. So I think this is a really rich area to look at. Thank you. Um, I, I really enjoyed this uh, topic. I'm a graduate of UCSD, mm. and I took bioethics classes back in the 70s, a long time ago there, and also worked at the medical school for many, many years until 1987, and became a minister. So I stepped Did out. we do that to you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm just I thinking. Know how that all happened, but the biomechanical model is alive and yeah. well at UCSD. <laughs> So, so I, I work in a research lab, and um, I can see even today how my shift from the, my clinical mind, my clinical brain has shifted to uh, when I do pastoral care and when I do uh, when I do hospice work and when I work with the patient and the doctor. Right. Um, there doesn't seem to be a lot of resistance. But I also know, um, well, I guess my question is, is that there's a body, mind, and spirit connection that seemed to be missing at the time of when, when I was working, that was many, many years ago. And I know things are shifting today in that world. And so my question is, is that how much of the body, mind, and spirit is being, not, not so much taught, but brought up in, in bioethics? Um. Well, I think it's <clears throat> I think it's there. <clears throat> I think it's there in bioethics. Um, although some people would argue that bioethics is too much in sway of really two things. One is the biomechanical model, and the other is this. Um, well, the three principles of the Belmont Report, you know, um, that govern sort of both research and medicine, autonomy, beneficence, and justice. And I always say, in the US, the thing that we all care about is autonomy and making our own choices. And that's so much of what gets 
in, um, emphasized in medical teaching and in bioethics. Um, we talk much less about beneficence and justice. Oh, justice is the really poor third cousin. Um, so I think, I think we've definitely shifted towards more of that. But for example, um, in our medical school now, we launched a new medical s curriculum after many, many years of study and organizational retooling um, that's presented as an integrated curriculum to first and second medical, first and second year medical students and then go to the clinic. From the very beginning, they start with patients, or at least with actors playing patients, and social and bi biologic or social behavioral medicine. Um, we talk about compassion. We talk about the patient. We talk about communication skills. We talk about cultural competence. Um, all of those kinds of things. However, as you probably may know from the newspapers, California is in a very, very dire situation financially. And we just learned last week that um, the social, the bio um, behavior part of this is now only going to be taught in the first year, not in the second. Um, so when money needs to be cut, we keep the science, we cut the social and behavioral stuff, and the ethics and, if you like, spirituality, any of that kind of stuff, that's, you know, again, that's that's sort of the last of those things. So when times are good, I think there's, and when we have time, there's a fair amount of that. It's robust. But when we don't, it's the first thing to be cut. I was just going to ask you about um, how does, we, we really talked about human to human transplant. So how does Williams integrate the idea of the demographic? And, um, you know, you mentioned your, you know, the pink uh, yeah. movement. And now some of the neurotechnological implants that are being developed. How does that change the, the, the um, discussion, the ethical questions that, are being, that we even ask in terms of, especially in dealing with the concept of death? Because <laughs> nothing has to die, and uh, no human has to die in order to provide these, these parts. So personally, I think that's what the whole issue is, that it's all about the care but I like your reasons. Well, it's an interesting question, which is how does this change when it's not human to human, either live or dead donor, but um, animal to human. I think ethically that raises a whole set of other questions about speciesism and, and so on. I mean, um, for some people, Genesis is a very bad text. Um, <clears throat> um, but in terms of some of the issues I'm interested in, uh, I do think it shows some of the same features, um, not as much so much about identity, but when you're going cross species, I think those issues of revulsion, um, worrying about contagion, um, people will say, you know, I don't want to have a, uh, a pig organ or an animal organ in my body because I think it will make me you know, somehow altered. So I think some of the same issues come up. And then there's another whole set of issues about whether we are entitled to be using another species sort of for our, um, sort of for our purposes. But that too ties into my question about whether we're shifting from a gift economy to thinking that really those who need the organs have some claim upon us, those who have them, maybe not so much while we're still walking and talking, but after our demise that somehow um, we owe them something. Um, and the, to say, I want to be buried as a whole body intact is somehow selfish. Um, another aspect of this that I didn't mention <clears throat> is that some people have claimed that with brain death criteria and the harvesting of organs, um, some people have argued that it interferes with grieving. This maybe goes back to your early, the man's point about reverence for the body. Um, because basically the body has to be maintained on machines until time to go to the operating room to remove the organs. And then the body will be you know, sewn up and brought back to the family. But that process of when somebody dies, um, of just sitting with the body, whether you're in some home or whether you're in a hospital, 
that possibility is, is really removed when you're talking about organ donation. Okay, let me see if I understand this. <clears throat> the idea is, why not think about the body in the way that we think about currency, which is as um, going through different stages, maybe not stages, but a kind of fluid sort of thing where there are different values attached to different stages. <clears throat> um, I don't know what I think about that idea. Um, I think my own inclination is to think that there's something um, absolutely um, that humanness just is embodied and that there's something about that that I am happy to take different attitudes towards, but the idea that they're actually different things, if I'm understanding you correctly. Um, I guess I'm, I'm inclined to think that we need to see more continuity from sort of birth to death, um, and maybe even afterwards, rather than thinking that the valuation shifts um, a great deal. I mean, one of the things that I guess, you know, going back again to Bill's talk and to Brent's talk this morning about the post-human project, the post-human seduction or temptation towards that project, of sort of living forever. Um, I don't know what I think about the idea of my mind being in a computer and living forever. I can't drink red wine and I can't eat chocolate, so maybe it's not so good. But, um, but the idea of my body sort of going on and being able to sort of have some kind of decent homeostasis, it's kind of, I mean, I get that temptation. Um, but again, one of the questions I often ask is, okay, supposing the post-humanists come in and they say, we've done it. Here it is. Drink it and you'll live forever. How many of you would drink? Do we really want to live forever? What would that mean? What would that do to living? I mean, I think these are really deep questions, but we have this assumption somehow that mortality is the problem. But there's an equal tradition of thinking that immortality would be the problem, at least bodily immortality, because in fact, I'd have to just continue and continue and continue. It's like Sartre's no exit. I don't know about that. Um, but I think it's worth thinking about because that is one response to posthumanism, which is not, not something about the means and what we're going to lose, but 
I mean, what we're going to gain and whether what we're going to gain is something that, in fact, is worth getting.